Hi there, my name is Jonathan Roth. This is Cambridge House Live. I'm joined now by Keith Schaefer. He's the editor and publisher of Oil and Gas Investments Bulletin. Keith, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. I want to talk a little bit about what's going on in the oil markets. We've seen uh, WTI oil drop from above $100 down to between $80 and $90. What's been going on there? What's, what's pushing the price lower? Well, you ha you've got two things going on right now. One, quasi-political, the macro scene in Europe, and two, a huge amount of new supply coming out of the states. So obviously the, the European debt drama is having an impact on everything, so oil is being sold down in anticipation of a financial crash of some kind. But also, fundamentally, in Texas and North Dakota, you are seeing a renaissance in oil production like no one ever thought possible. When the shale revolution started a few years ago, I never would have guessed they'd, the Americans would be able to produce that much oil that quickly. North Dakota has gone from 50,000 barrels a day to 650,000 barrels a day in about six years. Wow, that's incredible. And Texas is, their production curve just took a right left turn 90 degrees straight up about uh, a year ago with two already fairly proven plays. Mm -hmm. they, what they were able to do was just find all the really tight oil, the shale oil that was in between the other layers that they've known about for years, mm -hmm. but now have the technology with horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing to liberate. Right, so there's some incredible things happening, obviously, in terms of U.S. oil domestic production. Oh, it, it, it's stunning. You know, in 1970, the U.S. peaked out. I, I can't tell you what the exact number was, but they peaked out in 1970, and their oil production's been on a steady decline for 40 years. Yeah, a long time. They are going to be back to their all-time high, analysts are saying, by 2016, 2017. And from there, who knows where it goes. Who, yeah, even right through to 2020 right now, the numbers are looking pretty big. Okay, so so keeping that in mind, then what does that mean for the price of oil? Well, it, it's going to mean a, 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 the same kind of two-tier structure we have now. I, I think in North America, we are going to continue to enjoy the lowest oil prices in the world. Mm -hmm. So we've got a big refinery complex, and now we've got all this new supply coming on, so that should mean lower oil prices. How much lower? Well, that's the $64,000 question. Sure. I, I, I think there's two things happening here. One is that you know, we, we have a very captive market here. It's, it, it's actually quite profitable oil. So oil could still go down a long way and these guys would still make money with this new tight oil that they're finding in Texas. Right. The cost of production is quite a bit lower. What is the actual cost of production? Right, right now across most of North America, you're looking around $40 a barrel. Right. And then that yeah, includes oil sands in Alberta. Uh, well, where are they at? Yeah, they're they're a little bit higher. Yeah. But but again, once you've had payback and then your asset is paid off, mm -hmm. you know, just your operating costs, break right. even operating costs, are quite a bit lower. You you won't see any real production get shut in until oil's well under fifty bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. All right. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, what's going on in the global, the macro scene when it comes to oil, and particularly I want to talk about um, Saudi Arabia. It was an interesting conspiracy theory floated by Business Insider, a very reputable online uh, business news site, and they stated that they had some information that um, Saudi Arabia was deliberately uh, trying to flood the market with more oil with the idea of suppressing the price, uh, and that the goal of that was to bankrupt Iran and Iraq. Now, this is on a reputable business news site, so who knows if it's true or not. It's an interesting, interesting story, so take it for what it's worth. But before we started this, you had an interesting perspective in terms of what's going on with Saudi Arabia and the United States and uh, their oil uh, in terms of a flotilla that they put together, tankers that are sitting offshore, moving oil to the eastern seaboard of the United States. Connect all the dots for me because I didn't tell that story properly, but sure, you sure. told it really well, well, well before we started. What I'm seeing happen right now is that you've got an American election year. Right. So you, you've got, uh, just like in a couple different elections before, you've had very high oil prices. You've got administration that obviously wants to get reelected. So what, what I see happening is that there has been a, a huge new flotilla of tankers that's coming over uh, to the U.S. from Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has increased production by well over a million barrels a day here recently. And it's all aimed at the states to try and get lower oil to prices, drive prices lower. Drive prices lower so this is in the continental there's U.S. There's political impetus. To oh, make this I, I think so. Absolutely. You know, the, the, the reality is that uh, we need lower oil prices in the states if, if Obama wants to get reelected. I, I think that uh, the other issue is that uh, a lot of the oil here that you're seeing coming across is going to help lower oil prices for the refineries on the east coast right. because right now what's happening is the refinery industry in the middle of the continent 
and down at the Gulf Coast is doing quite well because they have access to all the cheap Bach and crude because WTI trades at such a big discount to Brent. But on the East Coast and even on California Coast, they import a lot of their oil from OPEC. And so they're paying full Brent prices and they're not making any money and these refineries are going bankrupt. So I think what they want to see happen here is to have all this new oil come in from Saudi Arabia, get the oil price down so these refineries can at least break even so they don't shut down because you've seen uh, one refinery in Philadelphia get sold to Delta Airlines because it wasn't making money. You've seen a, a couple other refineries on the East Coast go up for sale. You've seen a refinery just off the East Coast in the Caribbean get shut down. So, and that's because they're not making any money because the price of oil they're paying is so high at Brent prices and they're selling into a fairly cheap gas market. Right. So they've got to get these oil prices down because what will happen if you don't have some cheaper feedstock for these refineries, they will go bankrupt. And then the whole east coast of the U.S. could Seriously. be in a tough position in the middle of driving season, right? right. right. Like that, right. They might not be able to Sky find gas, gas prices if they can find it at all. Right, right. Okay, what, what role does OPEC still play in setting the price of oil globally? Well, you know, for the last 15, 25 years, they've been the big swing producer. They've been able to, with some degree of discipline, elevate and decrease oil production to manage a price. Sure. I really think we're going to see that die away fairly quickly because of all the new shale revolution in the States. Like, I think it's entirely possible the U.S. will increase their production by somewhere between half a million and a million barrels per day per year right. for the next five to seven years. So all of a sudden, that's going to take away a lot of the political and economic power that OPEC has over the oil price. Right. Interesting. So you see their influence globally as Waiting. decreasing. I mean, who knows what happens maybe a decade or two from now, but at least in the short term. Okay. Interesting. Now, there are two really uh, controversial pipeline proposals out there here in North America. Um, there's the Northern Gateway Pipeline that moves from the Alberta oil sands right through to Kitimat. And there's also the Keystone XL pipeline uh, that goes down to the states. President Obama, let's let's start with Keystone XL first. What's your perspective on the pipeline itself? Is it needed? Is it really needed? Um, and do you think it's going to happen? Uh, it's definitely needed for Canada. Uh, for the Americans, not so much, but e even uh, for for Canada, it's really important. So uh, I think the Obama administration is actually quite on side with it. I've always said that there's no way they're going to approve that pipeline before the election. And so, and e even during the debt drama in the states, when the Republicans were after them, Obama's number one bargaining chip was, as long as we don't talk about Keystone until after the election, sure. So I, I really do believe that after the U.S. presidential election, sometime early 2013, that is going to get approved. Uh, it, it's just a question of getting all the politics out of the way. And it makes economic sense for everybody. So obviously the more supply the U.S. can bring in to the country, the lower the oil price is going to be, which is going to keep consumers happier, voters happier, so it makes sense for everybody. Sure. Okay, now what about the Northern Gateway? Because there is a huge amount of opposition to this thing. I think a lot more than Enbridge or anyone else thought that there would be. I've got a big conspiracy theory on, on All right. the well, Gateway. Alright, well, float it, float like, it, like float it past the, the, the U.S. has no interest in the Northern Gateway proposal. The last thing they want to see is Canadian oil going to China. So it is totally in their interest to do whatever they can to make sure under the surface that that pipeline doesn't happen. Because what that's going to do is turn the oil sands into one of the cheapest sources of oil in the world for them into regular world prices. Right. So uh, there, there's no financial incentive for the big dog in the North American market to see that pipeline happen. Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting to see just how much that really gets going. Obviously the Chinese are putting a lot of pressure on the Canadian Prime Minister. You've got a majority government now, Mr. Harper. Get it done. And at the other side of that is the Obama administration, any, well, whatever administration there is in the States, saying, why would we want that? That makes no sense for our economic well-being. So it'll be an interesting uh, political and social tug of war to see how effective everybody is in getting their wishes. I, I just don't see that pipeline having a clear path to completion. Huh, interesting. Okay. That, that is, I, I'm not really sure. You don't have any hard data on that. Oh, of course not. That's, no, that's just, a conspiracy that's strictly, theory. Uh, that's okay. just off the top of my head. Okay. Well, you know, I think there's, there's obviously some logic in it for sure. 
Now, what about fracking? It is, remains a huge, huge controversial issue. The Obama administration has floated some proposals forward to say that maybe, you know, I, I think they, they tempered some of those proposals that they put forward down in the states in terms of, of the fracking regulations, but they still are trying to impose something on, uh, on the companies that are involved in that. What's your take on fracking overall? Is it safe or not? Yeah, yes, Frac fracking is safe when it's done properly. It, it's been done for 50 years. There's been thousands and tens of thousands of wells fracked with no issue. But what the industry, where the industry has shot themselves in the foot at every opportunity mm -hmm. is they've gone into non-traditional oil and gas areas and just pretended like it was Alberta or Texas. And all of a sudden they get this opposition. They're going, well, what are you talking about? And it's like their, their PR, the way they do business has just been silly. So what they what they need to do is they, they they've got the science in their back pocket. So that's great. They, 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 there's myriads of information they could bring out. Even in New York State now, they're saying yes, fracking is actually okay. But that doesn't mean anything because there's politics in this issue as well. And really, they just haven't done their PR and their politics very well. And, and to, to the people's credit, who are opposed to fracking, they, they've influenced a lot of change already. Like I, I really do believe that. In the next five years, John, we're going to see all fracking fluids be food grade. Interesting. Okay. Just and, and, and the industry wouldn't do that without the pressure. Without the pressure, yeah. for sure. So I, I, don't, I see that as a very good thing. That there's right. nothing wrong with that. And, and certainly they've been uh, coddled a bit by the previous U.S. administration, where they were exempted from the Safe Drinking Water yeah. Act. They yeah. never had to say what was in the fluids. So, you know, I'm thinking here that a little sense of entitlement has built up in the industry, and sure. now all of a sudden they've got a PR and media spotlight on them like they've never had in the past mm -hmm. and they don't know how to deal with it they've dealt with it quite poorly right but it is there so aside from the the optics they are actually working and there's a lot of work going on in these fracking companies and in the mud companies the fluid companies to develop these new uh, fluids that are, are getting greener and greener all the time and I really believe that that's going to culminate in five years with food grade fl fracking fluid and so you know, the industry and the mainstream are going to do a bit of a dance over the next year or two while they come to some agreement on and how all that works. You obviously feel this is a good dance. I mean, yeah, it, it is. I mean, I, there are I other issues, even dance. like earthquake problems. There are a lot of jurisdictions that's banned outright. Yeah, well, the, well, the earthquake issues are something a little bit different. Uh, uh, there, there's two issues there. One is that, uh, yes, they've shown that the saltwater disposal wells is really more what causes the earthquakes, but even the fracking causes what I'd call microquakes. Mm -hmm. Like here in Vancouver, we have four or five earthquakes a day, uh, but we never feel any of them. And, and that's the kind of level you're talking about for fracking. Mm -hmm. Where they had the big seismic activity in Ohio, mm -hmm. what the, the fracking fluid is generally fairly acidic when it goes underground. And if you stick it in a, in a limestone that's very basic, the alkaline eats away at the basic, right. you and you had, a you had a, a, a reaction where a huge amount of rock, and I'm guessing one to two miles square, mm -hmm. fell. That's going to cause a definite seismic, problems, yeah, a so. seismic activity. Right. So, uh, so is that a mistake by the company then? You know what? The I mean, reality they, is the, 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 that that geologists well, didn't know what was there. Somebody, I, mean, I would suggest, somebody didn't. Somebody screwed up. Somebody should have done a little more due diligence there. And and we we're lucky that nobody was hurt and there was no real lasting impacts. But hopefully now, again, that's another lesson that we can get on learning together, and so that these two, you know, mainstream life and and the oil and gas industry can live together. Interesting. Okay, you know what, there's so many more things we could talk about. Just oh. quickly, the price of, of natural gas has fallen by almost half the last little while. Why? Well, the, the gas, the shale revolution has, we have become so viciously efficient at uh, getting gas out of the ground in these shale deposits. A, there's a lot more shale gas deposits than shale oil deposits. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and we've just had more experience with them. And, and so now we know how to do it much better. And so the amount of production that we're getting per well has just gone up and up and up and up. The actual rig count, the number of rigs drilling for natural gas has gone like this. At the same time, production has gone like that. So you can just tell how much more efficient we've become. And so what, what, what's happening now is we've got year, years, if not decades, supply. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're, we're, we're starting to see, uh, you know, for the producers, the bullish factors would be right now uh, electricity is increasingly moving out of coal and into natural gas generated power. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got the liquid natural gas proposals in the U.S. and Canada yeah, yeah, that right here in Canada, could yeah. support, uh, you know, three BCF a day, billion cubic feet a day in Canada, and six to eight billion cubic feet a day in the states for export. 
So, but that's quite a few years away. So I, I really think we're still two to three years away from any significant turn. Hmm. Interesting. Well, listen, there's so many more things, as I say, to talk about, but I really do appreciate your time. Look forward to the next time. Thank you.